Welcome to the Culture Chat, hosted by WorkXO. Our mission is to upgrade work. Find out more about our workplace genome project at workxo.com. And now, over to our host for today. Hello. Hello, everybody. This is Charlie Judy, founder and CEO of WorkXO, welcoming you to another edition of the Culture Chat podcast that goes along with our Culture Chat blog and our organization that is largely, if not entirely, focused on culture. So it's all things culture. And I am excited to welcome today a longtime friend, colleague, and actually client, maybe we have to say former client, we'll figure that out, of WorkXO. Um, Dawn Burke has been in the trenches, which is the way I like to refer to HR professionals who actually are on the ground, living it, breathing it, doing it every day, uh, and not just pontificating about it. so, so Dawn is one of those professionals that has been in those trenches for many a year, but she's also unique in that she does lots of other cool and exciting things in the community and in the profession and in the social media sphere, and she's got a really good take and perspective on the world of work, the future of work, uh, and culture, and so we're really glad to have her here today. Um, I'm chiming in from Chile chilly, chilly, cold Chicago, (laughs) and Dawn is joining us from way down south in the Birmingham land. We like to call it the B-ham, the BAM. Um, And so, Dawn, welcome aboard. Tell the the audience a little bit just about yourself and what you're up to these days. Hey, guys. Hey, Charlie. Hello, WorkXO fans. Um, Pleasure to be here for sure. I love talking about this stuff. Um, I will pontificate today, if that's okay, Charlie. Um, and uh, yeah, yeah, you know, I have been uh, in corporate HR for the last 17 years. Uh, got out of corporate HR probably about five or six months ago uh, because it was time for me to uh, spend a little more time evangelizing the good word. Um, so right now I have what one would call a portfolio lifestyle. So um, I consult for Dawn Burke HR. I do a lot of speaking. I've been speaking across the country on topics such as culture um, and then doing a lot of writing and uh, some content marketing as well. So um, thrilled to be here talking about cultural topics is is my thing. So, and of course I love talking with you, Charlie. So um, thank you very much. Well, thank you, and glad that you are here. Um, just to tell a, a, a really quick story, and maybe as an endorsement to lots of things that are important about careers and work, et cetera. Dawn and I met, um, I'm going to say it was back in 2010 or thereabouts, and sure, I was writing right. my first blog. Yeah, I was writing my first blog, and Dawn was interested in getting into the blogosphere, and she did what many of us fail to do and that was pick up the phone and call me (laughs) and said hey (laughs) hey I'm just interested in learning more about this whole blogging thing what's it all about do you like it you know blah 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 and and we shot the shit and before you knew it Dawn had her own blog and she's been writing a hell of a lot more than I have um, over the the last several years and still writes and she's she's a a a contributor to Fistful of Talent for those of you um, who are in this space you'll know that very quickly uh, as one of the top read blogs in the kind of world of work. Um, and so, yeah, and then we maintained a relationship along the way and, and ultimately started working together. Uh, so, so those things happen still, right? I mean, just yeah. sometimes it just, it's, it starts with a phone call. So, Wait, um, no, and I think it's important, particularly as we talk about cultural things. Um, I, I do, do believe that uh, a lot of times we overthink things. Sometimes some lo-fi, low-tech stuff really works, a.k.a. pick up the phone and call someone. You would be surprised how often people will take your call and want to help you. So give people yep. some good intent and, you know, what the rest is history with me and Charlie. Now, you know, how we're old as shit now. We've been doing this forever. Got a few more wrinkles, but life is good. So th- th- there we go. <laughs> well, it's better for you because you're living the, the portfolio lifestyle, which, <laughs> you know, sounds, sounds glamorous. Yeah, um, right. So, 
so let's get down to the meat. We, all, we always start this with kind of one big question, and then we let the convo flow. We try to keep it under 25 minutes because that's kind of the average length of a commute uh, or a dog walk, although lately my <laughs> dog has not been getting those, those 25 minutes. Um, so here it is for you. And, and you're going to be able to provide some really good perspective on this because, because you've experienced it um, really firsthand. And, 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 and the question is, wh why is it so easy to talk about culture, but so hard to actually do something about it and stay committed to it and stay focused on it? That's kind of what I want to get your perspective on. And, and you can, you know, play with the very, you know, play with that question if you'd like, but that's kind of the general, the general context. Let's go, let's go with that. All right. I'm ready. Are you ready? You ready to jump let's in? Let's do it. You ready to do it? Yeah. All right. So yeah. first of all, I would say this, Charlie, I would say, first of all, it's not always easy to talk about culture. All right. So, so let's, uh, let's get that straight, buddy. Okay. <laughs> All right. No, I, I don't necessarily think it's always easy to talk about culture, but in the context of this conversation, what I'm finding I'm... after being in the trenches, and Charlie, did you coin that term, trench HR? Wasn't that your baby? That was my baby, All yes. Right. I mean, I don't know that it, it has any notoriety any, you know, beyond this, this very tight circle, but yeah, yes, I don't it's, think it was so. one you that need, I, I... You need to trademark that stuff. Trademark it, buddy. Everybody uses that term now. So anyway, I digress. Uh, so I think for the purposes of this conversation, Charlie, I'd say that in my experience, talking about culture is easier than actually doing something about culture, number one. Hmm. If we take it a step further, though, for those folks that do understand that understanding the company culture um, is important and they actually make strides, focused strides, deliberate strides to have an understanding of what the corporate culture is, we then have to take it to the next level. What I found it is very hard to maintain that standard of excellence um, as the company grows or um, goes through its own kind of uh, tenure of growth. So. Um, that's my short answer. Actually, that was a pretty long answer, but there we go. Well, so, so, tell, so tell me more about that. I mean, when, when, when you, when you, when you say it's, it, so, so it sounded like it's, it's, it's easier at some point, obviously, and it gets harder and harder talk a little bit right. more about why it gets harder and harder. All right. So let's, let's t talk about if the point of view of this conversation will be that, um, it, we're talking about companies that have already uh, started their culture journey, right? Every time I say journey, you can throw a tomato at my head virtually. So um, what I would say is uh, I think a lot of times we overthink as HR professionals um, what it takes to understand the culture. Now, now what do I mean by that? Um, it's not rocket science. Um, it's not easy. Let's get that clear. It's not rocket science to try to figure out what the culture is. Um, but what I have found is that there are certain variables, once people have laid that groundwork, once people know the way things work around here, that's I'm taking that from some things I've learned from WorkXO folks. Um, I think the problem is, is particularly if you're in a growth industry, inevitably the way things work around here are going to change. Um, and unless folks are continuing to be deliberate about understanding what the cultural nuances are, um, quite frankly, they'll be out of touch. And I've seen well-intended companies advocate for a culture that might be eight years old and think that as they grow, despite the fact that processes change, um, that, that what worked before will work again. Um, so I would say this, and, and this might be kind of harsh, um, I do think that people who at a certain stage in their, in their life, corporate-wise, that actually say, the culture's important, I'm gonna figure it out, and CEO, I'm gonna advocate for it. I think that that's important. But if you don't continue it, then all of that good work goes down the drain. It, it just still goes down the drain. And it, as a matter of fact, I probably will say shame on that CEO who doesn't continue because they know there's purpose in it. And if they lose sight of it within their, their, their growth, um, I, I think that's a failure. Uh, not only is it a failure, it's a big failure. So, so that's yeah. a little bit of where yeah, I'm, so I'm headed. No, it's great. I, and, 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 and so I want to, I want to kind of highlight a couple things that you said. One, you, you use the term, you know, kind of how we, f when we figure out how we work, like, I love that term. Of course, we use it all the time. H how we work is, is a lot to do with culture. 
right? right. Culture is, you know, let's just set the stage. We're not talking about foosball tables and beer in the fridge, right? We're talking about right. how we work, the behaviors and the actions that reinforce and clarify what it is that's truly valued in our organization. That is culture. And that right. stuff is understandably much easier to get your arms around when you're a 10 person organization, <laughs> right? And, and, sure. and uh, a CEO that, that has built this baby from, from scratch and, and, you know, it, it, it kind of lives and breathes by itself by virtue of the fact that you're around every day. But then your role changes and things, things get harder and harder. The, the problem which I, that, that you pointed out, and I, I want to I kind of get your perspective on this a little bit more, is, is this kind of assumption that we get forced to make. And, and that may not be anybody's real fault, right? Because we get distracted, we have competing priorities, et cetera, et cetera. But we assume all is going as planned. We assume that this culture that we work really, really hard to build is just going to go ahead and take care of itself. And that, sure. and that you know, it will grow organically just the way we want it to grow. And the fact of the matter is that doesn't work. So what's, what's your experience in kind of keeping, because you work really closely with a leadership team that was really focused on culture. What, what, was, your, what was your experience in, 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 in making sure that team stayed focused and committed to this really important thing? Well, I, I, I think I've seen two sides of it and I won't necessarily talk about one team. And let me give you a little bit of history about my work experience over the last 20 years. I have been fortunate. One of the reasons I love talking about this stuff, Charlie, is that I am one of the rare folks who's been fortunate that in the last companies I worked for, two in particular, um, where I had my HR career, um, both companies really were at its heart companies that were advocates of, of culture, whether they called that or not, but more importantly, making sure um, uh, that employees were treated well and there was employee advocacy and it was employee friendly. So, so I try not to take for granted that I have had um, that experience when others have not. So it's hard for me to imagine not working for a company that at some level, intuitively or deliberately, understood what they believed in beyond uh, values, but actually lived it, all right? So, so that's been my experience um, uh, for or the last 20 years, give or take. Um, I have, in both of these organizations, though, seen the same pattern. A leadership team, a part of, of which I was in some cases a part of, that was very focused on it at one point, and then as growth happened, their actions did not meet the words. What do I mean? As growth happened, it wasn't prioritized. People believed it was prioritized. They spoke to it as though understanding the culture as we grew. And when we talk about growth, we're talking about um, when you start going into mergers and acquisitions, you start bringing in cultures that are decentralized from your corporate headquarters. This happened in every organization I've worked for. And although the leadership teams I worked with very much still believed philosophically in the importance of cultural integrity and living by culture, actions did not speak as loud as words. And that's where I'm continuing to try to, as an HR professional, uh, try to understand how does the HR professional step in and wave a red flag when that starts to happen. Um, so I'll stop there for a so minute. So what did you? What have you done? No, no. I mean that's that's the, so you set the stage, you know, perfectly. I mean, I, okay. Well, how, how how do you how do you wave the flag? And 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 I mean, you know, and I, I, maybe it's not waving the flag so much as it is, um, you know, helping people keep tabs on it. But but yeah, sure, How do you sure. do that? What does that what does that look like well, to you? Well, I think some of it's knowledge is power. Um, HR pros that I, you know, a lot of people when I speak across the country, they'll come to me and they're very interested in culture, um, but they start to overthink it. They overcomplicate it. They're like, what do I do? Guys, first start with some basic research. You have to understand it yourself you start, before you start waving flags in front of leadership teams that, that frankly, as much as they love the idea of culture, they're not trying to ignore you or they're not trying to do what's wrong for the company. It is a prioritization issue. If they've got to deal with mergers and acquisitions, the cultural stuff is going to come second, all right? So you have to be educated and get resources uh, to help you in that. Um, number two, I think one of the things you have to do when you wave the flag is be an advocate for this is not easy work, but it's not rocket science. There are some basic tools that you can use to assess your culture, except, uh, to assess your culture markers, 
Um, and then I think the other thing you have to have is a little bit of courage. Hopefully you've got some trust and sweat equity with the leaders that you're talking to. Um, but I think one of the biggest obstacles I've seen is that leaders believe that when they've created values, number one, they don't necessarily know what culture is. So a lot of times when people, people believe, leaders believe that when they've created values, that inherently they already have a culture. Um, so I think as, as they grow, they realize they don't, they don't want to believe that other influencers, as you grow other cities, other departments actually are going to have these micro cultures that are going to affect the bigger picture. Um, so, so you have to continue to get in front of folks really with data and education. Um, you just begging somebody to just say culture is important, no matter how credible you are. Um, no matter how experienced you are, no matter how well known you might be, um, it, it, it's 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 going to be surpassed if you don't bring some data to the picture. And that's where some companies like and I'm and I'm going to say this, Charlie, or WorkXO comes into play. Um, you know, some lightweight tools that are going to help you do that. So, um, you know, I think that's one thing. And one other thing I'll say is, time is always going to be a pragmatic issue, right? Do you agree? Time? Yeah, yeah of course. Yeah. It's a bad excuse. It's a bad excuse for a, a, a company to say we don't have the time to really deliberately focus on this continuously. But I think if you can gently educate the, the leaders on how quickly you can get data, and even if you're a company that never has even done an assessment of what your culture is, again, not your values, but the way you do things around here. I mean, Charlie, in your experience, and I really want you to give me pushback on this because you're the expert. Oh my God, if you, if you do a couple of things, uh, get a third party to help with a survey, conduct some focus groups, get some qualitative information as well, you can get a structure of the way things work around here in four to eight weeks. I mean, it's yeah. not that intensive. I, now, push back on that, though, because... Well, no, I mean, I'm, of course I'm not going to, and, and, and thanks for... I mean, teeing it up. I'm I, obviously, you know, I, I don't want this to become a commercial for work. So um, I, I do think that there are some, there are many organizations that are starting to figure out how to respond to the, to the market need and, and, and the issues that you just identify um, to, to just kind of hit on a couple of them. Yeah. Data knowledge is power. That's how you started your whole response. Knowledge is power. And if you've got data, it's a much easier conversation to have with people, particularly people who are going to be skeptical and who are going to have their own opinions and they're going to have their own perceptions. And, and, and it's harder for those things to stand up in court if you've got data yeah. Yeah. to help you, you know, think otherwise and or to validate. I mean, sometimes the data just tells you what you already know intuitively, but it makes it that much stronger because now, yes, we actually have some proof of this, right? Yeah. So that's that's really important. And then the second thing of, of the things that you said that I think are really, really important is that you're absolutely right. Like culture, it's a big word. It means a lot of things and it means a lot of different th things to a lot of different people and a lot of different organizations. You know, how organization A defines its culture is different than how organization B defines it. And, and maybe that's okay. What's important between organization A and organization B is that they have a really good understanding of what are the one or two or three or four things which are kind of like non-negotiable. Like right, right. these are the one or two or three or four things that are so important to our success, not their success over there, but our success that we have to preserve them. We have to keep our eye on it. We have to measure it. We have to hold ourselves accountable to it. And we got to just work on it a little bit every day. It's like hitting the gym, yeah. right? You don't go to the gym for five hours at the, you know, or for, for, for 40 hours at the end of the year and hope to be in the right shape. You got to like <laughs> chip right. away at it. So, That's right. That's right. Sorry, I just muted myself. So, so yeah, so the one or two or three things, that's, that's key. And it's a lot easier to stomach culture work if you just chip away at it rather than saying, man, I got to fix a lot of stuff here. Yeah, and, and, and I, I will tell you this, and this is my experience, not just with culture, but in HR in general. Um, nobody, I think people feel a psychological threat if you present anybody anything, even if it's well-intended, in the format of, you know, we really got to fix everything. No, yeah. no, 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 no. I mean, that just, I'm sorry. If you come to me and say, 
hey, you know, we got to, hey, girl, you, you, you've baby stepped it. Your nails look pretty good, but your wardrobe is, we got to fix it. We got to fix your hair. Girl, we need to get your makeup taken care of. You know, I'm going to be like, whoa, 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 whoa. You said I got to fix everything? Uh, yeah, you kind of do. No, people are going to buck at that. I mean, they're going to buck at it. And that's just bad HR practice in general. Um, and, yeah. and, you know. Well, it's bad, so, it's bad business practice in general, right? Uh, I mean, we, right. You, right. Bad business practice. Yeah. I left the chipping away theory, um, and and you, and you don't have to do it all in one day, but you, you do have to have, as you grow up, a continuous focus on it. And, and one thing I'm going to say, I'm not sure how much time we have, but I think it's important, and, and, and I'm going to kind of throw something at you, Charlie, and to the culture experts that I think, I won't say we'll rock your world a little bit, but I, I have a thought that bucks, I think, the norm about, about culture. You ready? That's, I'm, I'm ready, man. I'm, I'm, like, I'm, I'm on the edge, on the edge of my seat. Okay. Yeah. Pretty much every yeah. webinar I go to, every white paper I read, every book on culture I read says one thing consistently. The only way that you can really have a sustainable corporate culture is if your CEO owns it and is an advocate for it. I disagree. Oh, I said it. I disagree. All right. So well, I don't, I go I, under my reasons why. Tell me what you think about that. Well, I'm no, I'm going to let you go into your reasons why because I mean I I, I, I uh, well I mean I'm in your camp on this. I I told I absolutely. Oh, you are? Awesome. Unconditionally dis disagree. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I don't think that that's true. I think maybe it used to be true, but I, I don't think it is anymore. It has a lot to do with how the organization, uh, organizations of today or of the future for that matter are really evolving, sure. um, but I'd like to hear your point of view on it. Yeah, yeah, so here's my disclaimer. I'm not gonna CEO bash. Actually, I'm gonna say, uh, I think it's one of the toughest jobs ever. It's a job I'd never wanna have. All right, so but we're talking about CEOs and CEOs get a lot of credit in many ways for corporate culture. All right. So here's, here's what I think. I think that a CEO and I'll say she, how about that? She or he definitely has to be an advocate of the culture. They have to evangelize it. They have to model whatever the cultural norms are. If they do not model that's it, the important I mean, piece right there. that's, that's if it. They, if yeah. they don't model it, it's all shit. It's bullshit. And I'm going to tell you why, because everybody, everybody has visibility to the CEO. They might not get FaceTime, but they see what the CEO does. And rest assured, if the CEO is talking out of this side of his mouth and doing something out of the other side of his mouth, everybody knows it and they believe the culture is bullshit. That's just the way it is. So CEOs, Great responsibility. You also get great reward, but you got to model it no matter what it is. All right. Well, and but that can be said, right? That we, we can say that same thing if, if for anybody that is in a role of, of, of influence and visibility in the organization, yeah. right? Whether, you, sure. whether your title is CEO or, you know, manager of a large department uh, or, or manager of three people for that matter. No, that's if, true. If, if, if you are not visibly tangibly advocating and living that culture, then all bets are off. Just all bets are off. Just quit saying you have a, just your culture is going to be whatever the CEO and leaders model. Um, every company I worked for, particularly the one, I mean, even like, again, the well-intended ones that were constantly focusing on it and really did some deliberate work with it. Every time though, there was one or two people on the executive leadership team that just didn't model it. They believed it. They didn't live it. Guess what? As an HR pro, you know how many people came to me and went, you know, this culture you're talking about, Dawn, that you're advocating for, it's bullshit. And I'd go, oh, why? Because CFO didn't do it. Because this person Okay, so wait, so wait, so wait. But this, all, this is all running contrary to what you're saying that, that you don't believe the CEO. No, I said the – okay, all right. So let's, let's back up. So all this right, is so where you have to clarify. Because I, yes, I know I, what you're I, saying, but I think it may get lost. Yeah. Gotcha. Okay, so here's, here's what I believe. We're going to back up and then I'll get back to what I just said. Um, I do not believe that the CEO anymore is the sole owner of culture. All right. Had to be before. Perhaps. Because maybe it's a new concept or new theory. But I'm not even going to go to the personal faults of a CEO in being able to not focus on it or they grow or whatnot. 
the issue with the CEO owning it is that you're putting the responsibility of culture on one person. And I'm sorry, particularly most companies, they're in the business to grow. Um, I think in every other type of business strategy, it's always smart to say, you can't have a single point of failure. Yet with culture, every white paper I read says, the CEO doesn't own it, it's going to fail. Well, guess what? You put a lot of pressure on that CEO because now you've made him or her a single point of failure. Um, and what I've seen, CEOs, as companies grow, their job becomes much more complex. And a lot of the times, by the nature of their role, they become more and more disengaged with the day-to-day -day operations. So that's why I would say, say, at some point, the CEO who is forward-thinking and truly believes in culture is going to give up some of that control on always, always saying they know what the culture is. They're going to give up that control, but be a part of the conversation of redefining what the culture is continuously, and then they have to, though, advocate for it. That's where yeah. I will say the CEO has to, has to be involved, because if they don't, then just fuck it. Just don't, don't even do it anymore. Just, just, just get out of the culture gig and keep on doing your thing. And that's all right, too. Thanks. Yeah. Okay. So, so, so the clarification here is, which, which is important, and I totally, I totally get it. And it's, I think, it, I think it's, it, it's an important distinction that 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 one person cannot own and or drive culture alone. Correct. That it needs to be owned and and embraced and advocated by all. And, and maybe even more importantly by some that are more visible for obvious reasons, right? Sure. But there is this, there, and, and we see this when we work with organizations, culture work sticks when you involve a cross-section of the organization, when everybody has a voice, when you get other people active in working with it. Then right. and, and, and doing that in a in a in a way that that represents obviously everybody's different point of view. I mean, what what's important for culture in one part of your organization is maybe a little bit different in another part of your organization. If you don't have both of those parts of the organization represented, forget about it. And so there's a little bit of this. You know, you, we all have to take some responsibility for this. I mean, part of what you're saying also is that yeah. you can't blame the CEO, man. I mean, like you all have to have some ownership and responsibility for making this the culture need it to be right yeah absolutely so absolutely. so we're up on our we're up on our 25 minutes as always is the case we could find hours more to talk and and you, you of course have the open invitation to come back and join us at any point <laughs> okay. along the way we always love to hear from you uh, dawn is i think officially the first person that's dropped an f-bomb on this podcast so that's Ooh, you know that's cool sorry. um that's hey that's all right. We're, we're adults. And we're, we're pulling this thing. I mean, I'm sitting here in my office, my home office today. And for just, you know, because this is, this is the way that my life works. There's two people mowing the lawn across the street. There's leaf <laughs> blowers going on right now. I mean, this is a comedy of errors. So, so, so I, I eventually, eventually, like when we get to like 10,000 downloads, we're going to move into a, 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 a you know, a, a nice professional <laughs> recording. <you know>. <laughs> <laughs> Do it right, that way. Right. So, and, and we'll, and we'll have one of those little, you know, bleeps for people Bleep. like you that actually drop F bombs. In the meantime, we can, you can, we can keep out. it in. Love it. No, we love yeah. it. So, okay. okay. So Dawn, thanks for being with us. Any, just say a few words about how people can find you and, and connect with you and all that stuff. Sure, sure. You can uh, check out my blog at dawnhburke.com. Um, my Twitter handle is at dawnhburke. Uh, I'm going to give you my email, dawnburke00 at gmail.com. You could also read my stuff at fistfuloftalent.com. Just Google Dawn Burke and you'll HR and, and you can find me. She'll pop up and, and she's likely to be on stage in a, in a venue. Um, near you anytime soon and if not over the next six to 12 months so keep your eyes open for that uh you can find us you can find me uh at workxo.com um and of course in the twitters at workxo uh, you can follow me personally at hr fishbowl and we'd love to hear from any one of you if you want to shoot the breeze with us about culture that's what we do and we love it don thanks so much for being with us and uh Talk to y'all soon. Bye bye. bye. And that was the 
culture chat today. We'll have some highlights up on the blog soon. Find out more about WorkXO and how to map your workplace genome at workxo.com.